Hello everyone, welcome to the 225 Literary and Jury Charge. We're going to start off with some Latin and French words. I will read you the words and then give you the paragraph. And I will read this at uh, 180. Okay, we'll consider this as literary. All right, here we go. So you're going to hear Liz Pendens, Res Judicata, Subpoena Duces Tecum, Alias Dictus. All right, here is your paragraph. A notice of Liz Pendens is issued to inform persons that litigation is pending. Liz Pendens means pending action or lawsuit. Res judicata means that a decision has been made in a court of law when a legal question has been decided and a court precedent has been established, the term res judicata is used. A subpoena ducis tecum is a court order to appear and to bring specified documents. The writ of subpoena ducis tecum commands a party to produce certain designated documents in court. In English, alias means an assumed name. The Romans used the expression alias dictus to refer to someone's nickname. The expression also known as, or AKA, is derived from alias dictus. All right. have an article here from actually it's an excerpt from don't sweat the small stuff this is on let go of the idea that gentle relaxed people can't be super achievers all right and I will read this at 180 we'll consider this literary all right here we go one of the major reasons so many of us remain hurried, frightened, and competitive and continue to live life as if it were one giant emergency is our fear that if we were to become more peaceful and loving, we would suddenly stop achieving our goals. We would become lazy and apathetic. You can put this fear to rest by realizing that the opposite is actually true. Fearful, frantic thinking takes an enormous amount of energy and drains the creativity and motivation from our lives. When you are fearful or frantic, you literally immobilize yourself from your greatest potential, not to mention enjoyment. Any success that you do have is despite your fear, not because of it. I have had the good fortune to surround myself with some very relaxed, peaceful, and loving people. Some of these people are best-selling authors, loving parents, counselors, computer experts, and chief executive officers. All of, them are all of them are fulfilled in what they do and are very proficient in their given skills. I have learned the important lesson. When you have what you want, inner peace, you are less distracted by your wants, needs, desires, and concerns. It's thus easier to concentrate, focus, achieve your goals, and to give back to others. I love the advice in that book. All right, jury charge. The subject here is fraud and deceit. All right, here we go. And I will read this at 200. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the issues in this case are issues of fraud and deceit Fraudulent representation or fraud, as the term is here used, may be defined as false statements of material facts in a transaction made by one party to another, made with knowledge of their falsity, or made as positive statements of fact without reference to their truth or falsity, and made with the intent that the other party shall act thereon. When such other party believes such statements and relies thereon, and is induced thereby to enter into a contract or transaction, and the statements are false and damage results to him, then such statements are fraud, which entitles the party injured to recover damages. Fraud is never presumed and must always be proved, and the burden of proof rests upon the parties asserting the fraud, the defendant in this case, to prove by a fair preponderance of the evidence, that is, the greater weight of the evidence, that he was defrauded as claimed by him. If you find the evidence on this question evenly balanced or that it preponderates in favor of the plaintiff, then you will find a verdict in plaintiff's favor. 
in order to recover on the ground of fraud or fraudulent representations, the party claiming to have been defrauded must have believed and relied upon the false statements made by the other party in the transaction, and if the party claiming fraud had knowledge of the real facts in connection with the transaction in question and relied upon his own knowledge and information and did not rely upon the statements made to him, then there is no fraud because the party asserting the fraud is not deceived. In this case, there is no fraud insofar as the contents of the agreement Exhibit 4 is concerned because it is admitted by the plaintiff that John Henry read the agreement Exhibit 4 and knew the contents thereof, and he was not deceived as to what Exhibit 4 contained. The only question of fraud in this case is whether the defendants agreed to execute a promissory note for $30,000 to the plaintiff and delivered Exhibit 4 purporting to be such a note and fraudulently stating to Tyler that Exhibit 4 was a promissory note for $30,000 and was the note referred to in Exhibit for and whether pursuant thereto Tyler believed said instrument to be a promissory note for thirty thousand dollars if under the rules given you you find and believe from the evidence that the defendant Morris representing the defendants at the time of making the agreement of settlement represented and stated to Tyler acting for the plaintiff in this case that the defendants would execute to the plaintiffs a promissory note for thirty thousand dollars and that later Morris delivered exhibit four to the said Tyler and then stated to him that the Exhibit 4 was a promissory note for $30,000 and was the note referred to in Exhibit 1 and do you find that these statements and the making of ex Exhibit 4 were done for the purpose of cheating and defrauding the plaintiff as claimed and you further find that Tyler believes said representations in both defendants that said Exhibit 4 was a promissory note on which defendants were personally liable and was the note referred to in Exhibit 4 and relied and acted thereon, then you will find a verdict in plaintiff's favor for $30,000 with interest added as provided for in said Exhibit 4. On the other hand, if you fail to so find from the preponderance of the evidence or you find the evidence equally balanced on either of these issues, or if you find that Morris did not make the fraudulent representations as claimed by the plaintiff, or you find that said Exhibit 4 was in accordance with the agreement of the parties or that the said Tyler at the time of receiving said Exhibit 4 knew that the contents and terms thereof, then in either case you will find a verdict in defendant's favor of no cause of action. If you find a verdict in plaintiff's favor in this case, it will be for the full amount of $30,000 with interest added as provided for in Exhibit 4. If you find a verdict in defendant's favor, it will be the usual verdict of no cause of action. All right. I have an article here. This is called Jacob is Dead, Isn't He? And it's drama in real life true story all right so i'm going to read this at 180 because it is considered literary here we go a cold wind was gusting down from the cumberland plateau last may 29 as rita bennett and her three small children drove up to their hilltop home in harriman tennessee Parking by the kitchen door, Rita 38 collected some clean shirts from the back of her car. Then helped by four-year-old Joshua, she slammed the back shut and carried the laundry into the house. In the driveway, the car with Jolie Ann, two, and ten-month-old Jacob still inside began to roll forward. Gathering speed, it went over a 60-foot embankment and plunged through the brush into a deep shaded pond. Rita came out of the house and stood there aghast. Where was the car? Her eyes searched the grounds. Then a terrifying thought occurred, the pond. She dashed to the embankment and saw her white car floating in the murky green water. She could hear the, her children crying. Rita raced for her phone and stabbed out her husband's office number. Tell Bill to come home right away, she gasped to his secretary. The car is in the pond. In an instant, she picked up her pace and began sprinting. Sliding down the embankment, she took a flying dive into the icy water. The car was now more than halfway across the pond's 70-foot width and submerged to the hood. When she reached it, she found a sobbing Jolie Ann standing on the floor next to the right rear door. It was locked, but the window was down about 10 inches. 
Come to me, Jolie, Rita coaxed. The little girl wiggled out into her mother's arms. Now Rita tried to free Jacob, still trapped into his car seat on the far side of the back seat. Holding Jolie Ann on her hip, Rita forced her head and right shoulder into the car. She felt it tipping forward. Water gushed up from the floor, rising rapidly. Her outstretched fingers pressed the red button to release the straps around the baby's shoulders, but from her awkward position, she was not able to apply enough pressure to release the harness. Rita withdrew to heft Jolie Ann higher. When she turned back, she saw the water rush over Jacob's head. He was drowning. Her mind shrieked. Then the water engulfed mother and daughter. Rita kicked away from the car and struggled to the bank of the pond. Oh my God, she thought. She wept hysterically as she crawled from the water. Jolie Ann clung to her crying. The black roof rack of the car was barely visible under the green slime of the pond. Rita had never been able to hold her breath underwater for more than a few seconds. Now with the car submerged, she felt trapped in a nightmare powerless to save her son. Mommy, mommy, Joshua shouted from the top of the embankment. Get Jacob out. I can't, Rita screamed. I can't. Clutching her daughter, she started toward the driveway. My baby has drowned, she thought. As Dr. William Bennett, a 35-year-old specialist in internal medicine, was talking with the patient at the Harriman Medical Center, his secretary relayed Rita's message. Bill and Rita had met during the war when she was a lieutenant in the nursing corps and he was a medic. Back home after their marriage, Rita's skill under pressure had put her much in demand as a trauma ward nurse, a grueling job she held until her husband finished medical school. Realizing that only a life-threatening emergency would have prompted Rita's panicked call, Bennett drove the four miles home as fast as he could, weaving through the heavy traffic with lights, with his lights flashing and horn blaring. Coming up the driveway, he spotted Joshua. The car is in the pond, the boy yelled. Jacob is in the car. Bennett's throat tightened as he looked over the water. Nothing broke the surface. He saw his wife and daughter through the trees and sprinted down the slope. Jacob is dead, Rita screamed. Where, he shouted. Rita pointed to a place about 50 feet further along. In the car seat, she said, right back windows open. The blur of the luggage rack caught Bennett's eye, and he went headlong into the water without even drawing a breath. His hand traced the top of the tailgate about five feet down. He worked around to the side into deeper water. The car was sinking into the mud with its front end tilted toward the center of the pond. The depth was 40 feet there. Bennett knew he had not a moment to spare. In the inky darkness, he felt the partly opened window and then discovered that the front passenger window was down. Bennett snaked his lean body into the car and groped around for Jacob. His fingers brushed the boy's arms. There... They were death cold, drifting lifelessly in the water. For an instant, the father recoiled with shock. He steadied himself with a palm against the roof and then stretched for the harness button. Something held him back. His shirt tail was caught. As he pushed with his feet against the dashboard, trying to break free, the hamstring tendon in his left leg cramped. Next, he felt the muscles below his chest go into spasms. Panic welled in him. He was out of breath, losing control, failing his son. Think, he told himself. Pull yourself together. He swam out of the window and came to the surface. Rita watched fearfully from the bank. Is Jacob dead? Where is Jacob, she called. Her husband did not reply. The air was clearing his mind. He had to summon help. There was still the awful question of whether Jacob could be revived without devastating brain damage. Bennett alone wanted to make the decision on attempting resuscitation. Call 911, Rita, he said. Go on. As she left, Bennett dived again. This time, he hooking his feet outside the window and lunging across the seat back for the release button on Jacob's harness. He pushed the button, but he could not apply enough direct pressure to release the straps. Once more, he came to the surface to marshal his thoughts. He remembered the pocket knife in his hip pocket. The straps could be cut, but he could not slash at them blindly in the darkness. He needed to get close. The car was settling ever deeper into the mud. Time was ticking away. The tailgate, it was usually unlocked, and it was higher out of the mud. 
Bennett dived for it, slipping the catch, and braced his feet on the back bumper. With all of his might, he heaved. Slowly, the door came up. Crawling into the back behind Jacob, he took out his knife and severed the straps to the baby seat. The child floated up into his father's arms. Backing out of the car, Bennett shot to daylight. As they reached the bank, the father turned the limp little body over his knee and pressed firmly on the back. A great gush of green water poured from the child's mouth. Bennett continued pumping. Water emptied from the lungs a second and third time. When he put the boy over onto his back, he saw two huge eyes staring sightlessly out of a mottled, dusky blue face. There was no pulse. Bennett began resuscitation. The fingers of his left hand pinched shut the nostrils and opened the mouth. Two fingers of the right hand pressed rhythmically on the breastbone. After every fifth move on the chest, Bennett blew air into Jacob's lungs. As he worked, his physician's mind kept questioning. The cold of the water would have slowed the metabolic processes in the child's brain cells, diminishing their demand for oxygen. But how long had Jacob been underwater? Fifteen minutes? For all that time, the tiny arteries had not been supplying blood to the critical outer cells. In practice, Bennett did not resuscitate prolonged cardiac arrest patients. He felt it was inhumane. Will I curse my own son with a fate worse than death, he asked himself. There was a stirring at his side. Joshua, run to the house, his father ordered. Bring me a blanket. The boy dashed off. Four minutes, five minutes, still no response, no pulse. Suddenly, the baby gasped. Bennett breathed more air into Jacob's mouth. The child inhaled and then he exhaled. When Joshua returned with a blanket, Jacob had strength enough to moan. Rita appeared on the distant bank. He's breathing, Bennett shouted. The mother wept with confused relief and anxiety. She knew as surely as her husband did that Jacob could be severely brain damaged. He had been submerged for at least 13 minutes. An ambulance soon was speeding Jacob to Harriman City Hospital. His body temperature was 92 degrees. His limbs twitched with the effects of oxygen deficiency. He was put under a warmer. He was put under a warmer, and gradually, after he was hyperventilated with oxygen, the spasms subsided. Intravenous salt solutions compensated for the natural sodium that had diluted in his body. Steroids brought down a swelling in his brain caused by the accumulation of metabolic byproducts. Late in the afternoon, Jacob was transferred to the intensive care ward of the East Tennessee Children's Hospital in Knoxville, where Rita paced the halls in tormented vigil. The next day, Bennett talked with the attending neurologist. Jacob's, Jacob's signs are normal, was the report. Every response is perfect. No apparent brain damage at all, the father asked in amazement. None, came the reply from the doctor. Bennett went into the ward and stood over his son's crib. Jacob beamed happily. Dada, he said in welcome. Two months later, the Bennett stood at the shallow end of a swimming pool with Jacob between them. He seemed to show no fear of the water. But if he was to be taught to swim like his brother and sister, he must first learn to hold his breath. Each taking an arm, his father and mother cried, one, two, three. Then they ducked their son under the water. He came up without a sputter, laughing with pleasure. The nightmare at the pond was really over. Pretty amazing. That's a true story. All right. How are we doing with time? Okay. So I've got some a definition here of bailment. Okay. I will read this. I'll read this at 200. All right, here we go. A bailment may be defined insofar as it applies to this case as a contract for the delivery of personal property for safekeeping and is a contract which is contemplated to be beneficial to both parties thereto, where the bailment is reciprocally beneficial to both parties, as in this case, the bailee, the defendant in this case is liable to the bailer, the plaintiff in this case, for the failure to exercise ordinary or reasonable care in the absence of a special agreement to the contrary. You are instructed that the defendant was negligent if he failed to exercise the degree of care in protecting the plaintiff's property that an ordinarily careful and prudent person would have exercised under the same or like circumstances. 
If the defendant used ordinary care and diligence, then he is not liable. But if he failed to use the ordinary care and diligence that an ordinarily prudent person would have used under the circumstances, then he is liable. The burden of proof is upon the plaintiff to prove by a fair preponderance of the evidence that there was a negligent or a neglect of duty that the defendant owed to him when the defendants became a bailee of the automobile. All right, so that concludes our literary and jury charge for the 225 class. Have a great day.